Howdy, howdy. Watch. Hey, everybody. I, uh, I'm uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and uh, welcome to our uh, session, um, bluntly titled, uh, How We Get Hacked and What We Can Do to Stop It. So you may be asking yourself, why is Jeffrey Katzenberg talking to me about hackers? <laughs> Truth is, I was actually hacked this past month. Uh, see, when it comes to technology, um, it's safe to say I'm a digital idiot. Uh, my whole life is uh, on that device, which is somebody took it away from me before I came out here, which is what stole, somebody stole it from me. Um, and, uh, and whatever isn't on the device, it's, you know, in the cloud. Um, I don't know how any of it works, and uh, I don't really feel like I need to. Point is, it's theirs, yours is too, whether you realize it or not. The devices we carry with us 24 hours a day open us up to enormous risks that we really give a passing thought to. If someone broke into your home today, uh, and they probably won't do it because you now have a ring doorbell, uh, you know, nest cameras uh, and alarms and whatever else, but say someone did break into your home, think about it, um, the damage would be some electronics, some TV sets, maybe a little bit of jewelry, certain, you know, very, very little cash. But if the same person broke into your phone, the damage would be enormous, extraordinary, in fact. A few years back, the digital non-idiots that uh, I work with started digging into the problems of online security. Um, we all saw the huge problem um, uh, that you know, has just been growing and how complex and challenging it has become for consumers to protect themselves, which is what brings us here. Uh, one of Wonderco's uh, portfolio companies, Aura, is taking this problem head on. And today we're all here to help unpack how hackers steal your information, what they use it for, and what might finally put consumers ahead of cyber criminals for the first time ever. Before we get into some fun stuff, um, I want to introduce um, our panelists. So, Rachel, would you yes. tell the audience a little bit about you? Hi, everybody. I'm that hacker that Jeffrey talked <laughs> about. So, Hari asked me to hack Jeffrey. I'm sure we'll get into that today. And I am the CEO of Social Proof Security. I get to hack people every single day as an ethical hacker. So, the only difference between what I do and what a criminal does is that I get consent before I do it. And I'm also the chair of the board for the nonprofit WISP, Women in Security and Privacy, when I'm not hacking. <laughs> Thank you. Hari? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Hari Ravichandran. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Aura. Uh, so a little bit of context about how we came across this problem with, uh, that we decided to solve at Aura. Uh, about 2014, uh, my identity got stolen. And so this was, you know, at the time, I think I was applying for a mortgage or something like that and uh, got rejected. And I started digging into it. I was wondering you know, how the information got out there, uh, what was stolen, what the impact uh, of that would be on, on financials, et cetera. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm a fairly technical person. It took me a couple of weeks. And I ended the, the kind of two or three week journey with a lot more questions than answers. And one of the things that I sort of figured out was there are a whole lot of these kind of individual small point solutions in the market, right? So basically you can go try to curate them, bring them all into one fold. There really wasn't one holistic solution out there. So that's really what Aura does. And you know, that's sort of part of the mission here for us is to create a safer internet, but to bring all these things under one umbrella. So it can be very accessible for regular folks and families. And then, you know, here's an important thing. We, when we started looking at the problem and how people were solving it, many of these things felt like fire alarms to me. So basically, you know, you have a fire in your home, you get an alert, you send the fire truck over to kind of uh, get rid of the fire. And what we thought would be a whole lot better and be very differentiated would be 
can you in fact stop the fire from happening in the first place? So can you actually have a proactive solution that stops a lot of these issues from starting up before, uh, before you have to kind of, you know, uh, end up falling victim to, uh, to one of these, these kinds of threats? So uh, that's really what we're yeah. at us. Yeah. So um, today uh, we're, uh, you know, we're here to help unpack how hackers uh, steal your information what they use it for, and what might finally put consumers ahead of the cyber for the first time ever. Um, when it comes to my uh, online profile, I'm actually pretty private about it. Uh, I have a, a very small uh, online uh, presence and therefore didn't actually think I was uh, going to be a very good target uh, for cybercrime. You are hard to hack, yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, to uh, prove to you all just how easy it is for hackers to break in, uh, Hari uh, challenged me uh, to turn off my aura for a few days. Then he contacted Rachel and put her to work. Uh, and, and that's how I ended up uh, here uh, with uh, Corella the hacker who hacked me and the guy who put her up to it. And here's a little video to show you how much fun they had at my expense. So you agreed to get hacked? You know, I am really safe on the internet. I don't open links that I shouldn't. I have a very, very low profile. I do not think I am a good target here. This is Jeffrey Katzenberg, co-founder and former CEO of DreamWorks and billionaire investor. What's happening today? I'm hacking Jeffrey Katzenberg. It's gonna be fun. This is Rachel Toback, and she can hack just about anything. As an ethical hacker, she's hacked news reporters, Fortune 500 companies, and everything in between. Jeffrey might think he's pretty safe. Most people do. But the truth is that nobody is unhackable. And it can be surprisingly easy to get in. Want to see how it's done? I'm in charge of the human hacking, and Evan is behind the technical elements of the exploit and hack. We're gonna build our pretext using information from data breaches and data brokerage sites. The first step for an attacker is to figure out who you are going to pretend to be and how you're gonna contact them. This hack, I think it makes sense to be Jeffrey's right-hand man, Anthony Soleil. Anthony recently had a Wall Street Journal article about him and Jeffrey's working relationship, and we can find more details about how to pretend to be in this hack from Jeffrey's work website. So this specific attack works because Jeffrey's computer is out of date. A security researcher has found a vulnerability in Jeffrey's software, and now that's publicly known. The vendor has since fixed this problem, but since Jeffrey hasn't updated, the patches aren't protecting him yet. Now it's time to send Jeffrey our message with the malicious link. So what we're gonna do is place a call to Jeffrey and we're gonna spoof the phone number, make the caller ID look like it's calling from Anthony. We're also gonna use voice changing software and add in background noise. So it sounds like I'm in a really loud place and I can't really hear him because I can't do Anthony's voice. So I can only say a little bit. So as I, you know, I think we were talking about, I, I, I really think I'm, sorry. Hey Anthony, what's up? What? Check, check email? Uh-oh, oh, okay. I think we got it. Hey Mindy, can I have you come in? He clicked, okay, we got it. Okay, so now our attack prompts Jeffrey to open a shared cloud folder, which we told him to expect in the phishing email. Once he clicks open, the rest of the attack will continue in the background, and we'll be able to steal data from any site he's currently logged. Second here, guys. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. That's how we hacked a billionaire. It was at this point that we thought it might be nice to tell Jeffrey exactly what had happened. Oh boy, Rachel, Jeffrey. Evan, <laughs> you people are bad people. Guess I was just a bit too confident. Is it okay if I come in? Come on I'm in. coming in. Come on, I already hacked you. It's worse than I realized. No, it can't be any worse than I think. It is. Come on. Let me show you. Yeah. I can't <laughs> wait to hear the good news here. <laughs> you probably want to know what all happened, what all went down. Yeah, I'd say. You remember that email from Anthony? Yeah. That was me. How is it you if it's from Anthony? I had a lookalike email address, so it looked like I was emailing from Anthony, but I was actually emailing as myself. So how do you get a... You can just purchase it. It's .co instead of .com. And then the phone number, I was spoofing that phone call. So I know, but it was Anthony's voice. I used a voice changer 
Yeah, that's bananas. Isn't that nuts? <laughs> and so you probably want to see what I got from you. I probably don't, but I <laughs> think you're going to show it to me anyway. So. Yeah, the first thing that we were able to steal. See, my driver's license. Probably also recognize that I was able to steal your passport, passport. COVID card, pictures of your grandkids. These pictures were in your cloud. So any website that you're currently logged into, we could access. Because you were logged into your email on your machine, we were able to steal all your emails. <laughs> <laughs> because you clicked the malicious link and your computer was out of date. So you know how that little thing will come in on the side and it'll say, update your computer yeah. now? And yeah. you're like, no, thank right. you. I would rather do anything else. And enough of those weeks built up and we had a known vulnerability with your computer out of date that we were able to leverage against you. You are really malicious. <laughs> <laughs> So we were also able to steal your contacts, which is scary because, you know, you're a pretty connected individual. When you are hacked, there's a huge blast radius among you and all of the people that you have connections with. You remember when you got that phone call from Anthony, yep. right? Well, unfortunately, when you click that link, we were able to gain access to your mic, and we didn't even indicate that that mic was on, and we were able to listen in on your call. So you want me to roll the footage back for you here? No, I, I take your word for it. All right. <laughs> I'm going to play it anyway. Oh, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Remember that call? Yeah. You don't even really use the internet that much. No, I have a super low profile, and, right. but it's amazing just how vulnerable we all are. I know. It's scary stuff. Thanks for being a good sport. Thank you. For <laughs> nothing. <laughs> All right, you guys, get out of here. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. Have a shitty trip. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks for nothing. All right, so I was wrong, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a scary time to be a digital idiot. So, Rachel, why don't you start by uh, explaining to us here... <laughs> what you were up to. Yeah, let me break it down. Okay, so what we did first is we had to figure out how we were going to contact Jeffrey Katzenberg. That's not the easiest thing to do in the world, right? So we had to start by looking at data breaches and data brokerage sites. If you've ever Googled yourself, and I recommend you do it now if you've never done it before, Google yourself and see if your address, phone number, family members, birthday shows up. I'm very curious, please do come up after and let me know if you see that you don't have that information because it's so common. So that's how we got your contact information. Then from there, we need to determine who we're going to pretend to be. And we decided to be Anthony because that Wall Street Journal article had just come out. So much good information in there. And so we had to do the same thing for Anthony, figure out how to contact him, or how to pretend to be him, rather. Which email address should we use? Which phone number should we use? Because we had to be able to spoof it and really show up on your caller ID as Anthony and make it believable. So went through the data breaches, data brokerage sites from there. Then I went to Evan, who's the technical side of the operation. I'm the human hacker, he's the technical hacker. And I asked him, Evan, I want you to assume that I can get somebody to click a link with my impersonation and my social engineering and my phishing. What can we do once they click the link? I want you to build me an exploit. And Ryan Pickering's research had just come out where he actually got the largest bug bounty, $100,000 plus, from Apple very recently. And so we were like, oh my gosh, we're going to use that and we're going to try and get it to work on his machine. Now, the machine needs to be out of date. See how proud she is of all this? It's like, oh my God, you got It's it. so exciting when you get an exploit to actually work and run, right? You're evil. Any hackers in the audience here? Anybody know what I'm talking about? OK, I see a couple. All right, awesome. Um, and so how it worked is once Jeffrey clicked that link, it downloaded a bunch of files to his computer, and it allowed us to kind of act as a different web page and look at the different content that he had on his computer so we could act as Gmail or act as iCloud to be able to solicit, you know, get all that information back to us for his photos, his email, um, his DMs, anything that had an open session on his computer. And that's scary stuff because think about all the stuff that you can go to, all the websites where you're already logged in, right? Sometimes we have to log back in, but a lot of times we're already logged in. Any of those open sessions, I could grab because of this exploit. But if your computer's up to date, it won't work. So I'll have to find out something else for you. <laughs> Thanks for nothing. Um, Hari, how do we um, uh, get to a place where all of us can start to trust our, uh, our, our digital interactions? 
it, it, the, you know, a good analogy for this is um, if you have a home and you have a front door, you can try to lock your door and you can make sure that uh, it's fortified. But if you leave all your windows open on the back end, uh, then it's easy access for folks to be able to get into your home, et cetera. So really, as a, a regular family or a consumer or um, as someone using these services, the amount of devices and the amount of connectivity we have now has really exploded. I mean, we, we find uh, there's about 50 connected devices per home. You think about all your iPads and your and your uh, t uh, even your televisions, your printers, et cetera. When you add it all up, it's uh, it's quite a bit there. So you have to make sure that every one of these vulnerability points has been fortified. Uh, it's got to be sort of uh, uh, in an integrated way, you are always uh, in charge of your own security uh, for you and your family. So you have to both stay vigilant and you gotta make sure you've got the right tools, uh, not just for one or two things, but the entirety of your digital life. And people, people really need examples to understand how to stay safe online, right? If I just tell you, don't click links, you're like, that's not useful information. I have to <laughs> click links for my job. If I don't click a link from HR, they're gonna fire me, right? Because I need to sign that form for them. So we can't just say this like blanket advice, don't click links, don't download things. But we can say stuff like, you don't wanna click links if your computer's out of date, right? Because then I can do X, Y, Z, like what I just talked about. So people need the examples of why is that important? Why should I care? I have so much stuff I have to worry about every day. Why do I care about updating my machine? Why do I care about making sure that my passwords are long, unique, and random for every single account? Well, we'll get into all of those examples and why it matters. So uh, with me, with such a low profile, and obviously how incredibly simple and easy it was for you to do that, so what, what are, again, I keep coming back to, what are the tactical things yeah. um, that we should be doing about it? Yeah, so the first thing that I really want to impress upon everybody is this specific type of attack isn't gonna work for you if your computer is up to date. So keep that machine patched, your phone, your computer. You wanna make sure also that you are delisting yourself. That if you Google yourself, that's kind of just a fancy word for saying, don't make yourself so Googleable, right? You don't want all of that information online. And there's tools that you can use that we'll get into today that delist your content for you so that you don't have to go to every single one of those 50 pages that has your address, phone number, and take it down yourself because they actually require that you send in a fax. Yes, they do that to be <laughs> obnoxious. Um, and there's many other things we'll get into today about passwords and multi-factor authentication, but high-level stuff. So, Ari, over the last 30 years, there's been an enormous amount of uh, both investment and innovation uh, around enterprise security. Why hasn't anybody tackled this for all of us, for the consumer? There seems to have been very little you know, innovation and, and investment in that. Why? You know, I think if you follow the dollars, there's been $300 billion plus uh, investment in the last five years around uh, enterprise security. When enterprises buy things, they buy in uh, with big checks. You know, they have a lot more resources. When people start thinking about the business of providing security to consumers, they're much smaller ticket items. You have to get the audience to get engaged. So historically, the dollars really haven't flown down that path. But really, what's been happening in the last three to five years is sort of this acceleration, uh, especially with the pandemic, even over the last two years, and the blurring of the lines between work and home. People are working from home now. There's uh, uh, maybe kids are doing remote school. Uh, you know, you're using your own device uh, for your work stuff. Uh, all of these lines are starting to blur. So. Um, it's really kind of incumbent now, both for enterprises and for consumers, to make sure that things are safe. Uh, but part of the problem then becomes, because there's historically not been a whole lot of dollars that have gone into this, there's not a lot of good solutions out there. So many of the solutions you find, you know, they were built in 1996 for your desktop, and it, it just doesn't fit the modern consumer all that well. And that's actually been a lot of the kind of chicken and egg problem. There wasn't money, there was no innovation. Now you really need it. There are no solutions. And so so um, a lot of us have children, in my case, grandchildren. Um, how, how should we be thinking today about uh, children's safety online? Uh, look, I'm, I'm a dad. I've got three kids. And this is something that weighs pretty heavily uh, in, in my mind as well. We, we kind of really break it down into three uh, buckets. The first is kids, you know, especially sort of younger kids, 
that are born into the digital world, they are pretty fearless. I mean, they will go put information about themselves or their families pretty much anywhere on the internet. So just to make sure that identity, which is sort of the first bucket, uh, is protected because if they start to give out information that potentially puts the rest of the, the, the family or the finance of the family at risk, that's a, that's a big area to educate them and make sure there's some good identity protection in place. Uh, the second thing I would say for kids, especially as they get a bit older, you then worry on the inbound side, what kind of content is my kid consuming? Um, is this safe for them? You know, how is it gonna affect their development, et cetera? So making sure you've got controls around what kind of content they're viewing and having a good pulse on that, which actually turns out to be a hard problem because kids have like a school iPad, they have a home iPad, they've got phones. So to kind of go through and figure out how all of this stuff is interacting and working, where are they kind of uh, viewing content, you need something holistic there as well. And then the third area I would say is this notion of just mental and emotional well-being for kids. Are they using their devices too much? How do you set up the right amount of screen time? How do you make sure that uh, you've got some good balance there? So these are uh, problems that we're working on, hopefully in our uh, release in June. Uh, we made an acquisition at Aura of a company called Circle back in December. All these features are getting integrated, so it's all there, part of the same price as part of the same bundle. Right. And what does so. Circle do? And so Circle was pretty much, uh, uh, or continues to be one of the best products in the market for parental controls. So content filtering, geo-tracking uh, for making sure that if a family wants to make sure their kids got to school on time, et cetera, you can track them. Uh, and also uh, setting up incentive structures in place to help people reduce screen time and help their kids kind of reduce, uh, reduce screen time. So if they're on TikTok or Instagram or Discord, is it, are, are you shutting down access to the platform or is it actually helping control what they're seeing with on the platform? It's, it's the latter. So and you can set up time limits on it as well and you can basically, a lot of content gets categorized so you can kind of turn on certain features, turn off certain features. If they're over a certain time limit, et cetera, you can actually turn off access to all streaming sites for, for, for a bit of time. But the nice thing about it is, is that it's universal because the big problem that I, I have with my own kids is if I have to go back and monitor them and regulate every one of their devices, it's like, like a half a full-time job just to be able to stay on top of it. So this does it across all of the devices that you, uh, that you need to manage for your, for your kids. And I think a lot of times people don't think of children's accounts as super high value, right? They're like, oh, they're just, um, the first thing that comes to mind is Neopets. Of course, that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Kids don't play that anymore. Um, but you know, like you're thinking about a Neopets account. If you ever played something like that as a kid, and you're thinking like, that's a throwaway account. Who cares if it gets hacked, right? but they probably use that password on many other accounts. And therein lies the problem. If something like a fun game that they play online gets breached, well, suddenly as a hacker now, I can go into that data breach, take all of those passwords, and stuff them into all the other accounts. And maybe I can get address, personal details, personal photos, things that are very sensitive for children. So we have to consider children's accounts just as serious, just as needing protection as an adult's account. So we had lots of conversation today <clears throat> about digital universes uh, and, you know, as we move into the metaverse. Um, is there a new set of vulnerabilities that we're going to have and how, how should we be thinking about that? Yeah, absolutely. Think about your life in physical space. When you walk around, when you're talking to people, um, you can pretty much be sure that the person that you're talking to, unless it's like the movie Face Off, is who they say they are, right? Because you're looking at them, you know that individual, they're your coworker, they're your friend, whatever. In the metaverse, you're walking around and somebody's account could be taken over. That's something that I do super frequently. It's called account takeover. You can either call up support, pretending to be that individual and gain access to their account, or you can look up their passwords in a data breach, or you can fish them to gain access to their credentials and log in as an individual. But imagine you go into a situation, a work meeting in the metaverse, I'm sure this is gonna happen for all of us one day, and somebody shows up, you think it's Jeffrey Katzenberg, ends up it's Jeffrey Katzenberg's hacker, right? So these are the types of things where we really need to think about harassment, abuse, account takeover within the metaverse as well. If you're working at a company and you're thinking about the metaverse and how to protect against these things, I really hope you keep the hacker perspective in mind because hackers are going to hack. They're going to do that for the metaverse, they're gonna do that for typical online accounts and in person. 
So you guys are living and breathing, uh, you know, these kind of security issues every day. What surprises you? What what are you what are you seeing now in terms of elevated, you know, breaches and you know what's what's the newest, you know, way in which you know cyber criminals are after us these days that we haven't figured out yet. We don't yeah, even know. I mean, you know, it's 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 shocking to me how much data is out there and how accessible the data is uh, for folks, right? I mean, you can literally go in some of these sort of uh, uh, tour sort of darknet sites and buy a package. It's almost like a menu card where you can say, I want to buy a half a million identities. I'll pay this much. You can see some of these transaction logs kind of going back and forth. You can go, uh, you know, pick up a bunch of credit card numbers, you know, information, et cetera. So both the liquidity and the the sort of the accessibility of this information is shocking. And, and it, it's no longer something that people are doing because they want to impress their hacker buddies. This is a criminal enterprise. I mean, there's a lot of money flowing into that ecosystem. There is uh, a lot of access, and when it's a well-funded operation, uh, unless you really kind of do something to put the skids on it, it'll keep accelerating, and that, that to me is scary. Yeah, something that really surprises me is that I'll be talking with folks, and every day I just repeat these things. You have to make sure that you don't reuse your password, right? Um, we know from Google's online security survey in 2019 that most people reuse their passwords. I'm not going to make you raise your hands right now if you reuse your passwords, because I don't want you to think I'm hacking you. But I really want you to <laughs> dig deep right now and think, do I reuse my passwords on multiple accounts? Do you use the same password for your bank as your movie streaming site? How about your Gmail? Because if it is, then I can find it, stuff it into your email, and then reset all of your other accounts to your email. So I really want you to start thinking about your threat model. You know, you might not be in the public eye as much as Jeffrey. Jeffrey has a very elevated threat model because he's, you know, well known, he's in the public eye, um, has assets. You might be thinking like, what is it that a hacker would want with little old me? Well, there's plenty that I want with little old you, and that is money, your crypto wallet, NFTs, your social media pages, your Gmail, because you have access to other people too. And that's useful for me as a hacker. So you have to think about the blast radius around you. It's not just you. And so what surprises me is that a lot of people that I talk to still aren't back to basics. Okay, you know, so, wait, so let's go back to basics. I'm gonna start with you, yeah. Hurry, which is, um, Three, each of you, three very specific, very tactical things that you would give all of us as advice today that we should be doing. Yeah, so I mean, one, one thing that we see quite a bit, especially in the identity uh, theft space, is when you get a notice that you've been breached, for example, which seems to happen sort of once a week, you know, once every, uh, every, every few weeks. Mostly people look at it and just say, okay, let's throw that away. But typically that sort of uh, uh, precursor to potentially some financial fraud or negative activity happening because when your data got breached, if some of that same information is reusable. So there, I, what I would kind of highly encourage folks to do is if you get a breach notice, don't wait till the end of the month to look at your credit card statement. Make sure you're looking out for suspicious activity. Uh, same thing with freezing or locking your credit. There's a lot of tools available uh, to go do that. So that's one big bucket. Second thing on parental controls, uh, trying to make sure you've got something in place uh, because again, kids are so impressionable and they just don't know any better. So you could be putting your own data and perhaps their development at risk as well by not having some form of protection around it, whatever the family feels comfortable with. But the third one, obviously, with uh, Jeffrey and, and Rachel, we just saw she, uh, uh, you know, the, the annoying uh, thing that says, you know, go, go ahead and update your security settings that nobody ever wants to do because you got to take your uh, computer down. But that's what can happen. And this is very targeted. So I definitely say, making sure that your security patches across uh, your device are up to date because it really is a cat and mouse game. You can never kind of solve it uh, for good. It's something that uh, something pops up, the vendor then comes up with a fix. If you don't apply it, then you've got that potential exploit that's sitting, uh, sitting in your system. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll put the most boring one first because you've heard me say it and I'll say it again, passwords, passwords, passwords. I would say an actionable step that you can take today, tomorrow, the next day is sit in your hotel room and think, do I reuse my password for my bank? And where else is that password? And get a sense of what's going on for you. You can actually look up whether or not you're involved in different data breaches. I know there's a lot of tools out there for that. Um, and then after that, I really want you to think about how you're protecting your accounts. The second one is multi-factor authentication. So I just want to ask a question, not about MFA, but to, to kind of drive this home for you. 
Who here has experienced a scam text message, email, phone call within the last year? Someone pretending to be an executive. Almost every single hand is in the air. Pretending to be an executive, uh, in contact you say they want gift cards, right? Who has received that gift card scam? Super common, yes. Who has received a scam that somebody is saying, um, you have a package that's, you know, the shipping notification and you're not gonna be home and, yeah, right, everybody. These types of scams are everywhere. If you haven't experienced one yet, either your spam filter's really good or you might just delete a lot of your emails. Uh, they also get a text message now, right? People pretending to be from your bank, saying things like, hey, uh, you have, the, you know, was this, a, was this a purchase from you in Florida on this date for $400? And you're like, no, that wasn't me. Here's a phone number you can go to call and, and get it taken care of. Well, who's on the other line of that phone? It's me, the scammer, right? And so I really want people to understand that they need MFA both in the physical human realm and within your technical tools. So in the physical human realm, I call that being politely paranoid. That means we need to confirm people are who they say they are by using two methods of communication. If someone emails you, someone calls you, use a different form of communication to confirm they are who they say they are. If I get a call from my bank and they say, hey, we need you to, <laughs> we need you to call um, us and, and do all this information, I'm saying, well, I'm not gonna give you my address over the phone right now, I'm gonna call back the number on the back of the card, right? And then when you have your technical tools, you need to make sure that you're using something like YubiKey, a hardware key for your MFA, if you have an elevated threat model, something that I would have to be in person with you to steal. Rachel, what part of the digital idiot did you not get <laughs> all these things you've asked me to do, so? No, you can do okay. any sort of MFA is better than nothing, right? Okay, well, so, Ari, how, how are you going to make this super, super simple for digital dummy over here? Look, you know, when we started out, like I was saying, we thought sort of the, the big solve would be to bring all these things into uh, one umbrella, make it easy for consumers to use and have it be something that's uh, affordable. Uh, that, that turns out to be true, but we have sort of an addendum to that in some ways, which is it's not just bringing it all into one roof, but it's also trying to automate the fix in a, in a lot of ways. So when, if you have to get proactive, uh, the threat profile of every one of you here is going to be a little bit different. You know, what, uh, Ra how Rachel uses the Internet, what kind of services she uses versus Jeffrey, it's going to be quite different. So what we've been working on doing is to try to bring... Um, a lot of insight that are, that's very specific to each individual, along with bringing all the tools that we need on the back end, and then build out an automation framework where instead of coming to you and saying, okay, you should go change your password now, uh, what we'll do is, uh, at the right point in time, we'll actually change the password on your behalf and put the new password inside the vault. You know, if we say, okay, you've got uh, a credit card, and that credit card was in a breach, uh, and you're using the same passwords, now you've got an elevated threat level. So at the right point in time, we'll actually do the work on your behalf. So when you can go from all in one um, to then be very personalized, and at the same time, uh, you've got the ability to automate the fix, it gets a whole lot easier because then you're not telling people to go do something where they say, I, I still don't understand what you're saying. It seems tough or difficult to me, and I don't want to expend the effort around it. You actually just try to do it for them. That's the way to get the adoption. Uh, is, is to simplify it down to, to that level, so. Great. Um, we're gonna throw the lights up and, and uh, open up for questions that uh, you all might have. So, see if we can th turn those lights Ooh, up a bit like more. looks like they're there. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty hard to see. I can read them to you, you want me to read them to you? Oh, great. Sure, go for it. You now have the resources to match your ambition. How does it compare to being at a more resource-constrained place? Any lessons you think can be applied? Was that for? I think that's for you. Oh, that's for me. I think uh, it's for you. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I would say uh, if we're talking about the business, um, you know, uh, I, definitely I would say having a bit more resource to solve a big problem uh, helps quite a bit. But... Certainly, uh, in terms of basically solving this particular problem, uh, the way we have thought about it is the kind of couple of weeks that I spent uh, to try to figure out how this problem all worked and why I got breached, uh, why I got hacked, uh, and all that, all that type of stuff, if we can get that really kind of shrink-wrapped and use technology and automation 
to be able to do that for everybody at an affordable uh, level, I think that would be uh, that would be uh, pretty uh, pretty phenomenal. So those questions are now coming up, at least on our monitor, for an Amazon yeah. session. I so packed this monitor, and it's now all about Amazon <laughs> so Prime. That has nothing to do with us. And so I actually think we have to turn those lights up and see if there are hands and there are people. There we go. A question down here. Mike, coming your way, I hope. Or you can just yell. Sure. Yeah, you want me to talk about no, the please, SimSwapping thing first? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, this awesome question from the audience is all about SIM swapping. Um, and what they asked is, how do we avoid falling or getting these SIM swapping attacks happening to us if we use two-factor authentication by sending a text message to our phone? So this is something I really want you to keep in mind if you are big in the crypto space. Something that we're seeing uh, is that folks who have a lot of assets on their phone they're, the attacker is going straight, not to the person they're trying to attack, but to the telecom company. They're calling up Verizon, T-Mobile, et cetera, and they're saying, hi, I am this person, and I need access to my account. I'm traveling abroad. Um, please give me access to that account, right? And so with that SIM swap, that type of attack where you contact the uh, telecom company directly, I recommend that you upgrade your MFA and you're not just using SMS two-factor. Move towards something like app-based or a YubiKey, like a hardware key. You really have to consider your threat model there. And when it comes to training, you might have some thoughts yeah, too. Yeah, so I mean, on, on the training side, it's an ongoing battle, right? Because the, like the whole ecosystem is never static. You know, the same data gets packaged or repackaged a dozen different ways for the next new attack that kind of comes to comes to bear. So uh, it's a, like the way we look at it, it's a constant vigilance type of model where you have to uh, continuously tell employees what the what the uh, new sort of you know pattern that's sort of shown up is, uh, what the fix is, et cetera. We do do sort of you know no before uh, focus sort of training programs for the the uh, CISO, uh, for the CISO's organization basically, uh, but it is something that's uh, it's very much still kind of cat and mouse. Uh, it is something you have to stay on top of, and it is something that you really need an owner inside the business. Uh, typically, it's the the CISO in in the organization that can then. Uh, proliferate that information across various different groups and some of it we just make it mandatory we're like hey th this is stuff that all employees need to know and we want to do this training like once every six months and so that's uh, that's been the approach okay so hurry how long did it take you to recover from getting your identity stolen how much damage did it really do I mean it's it's shocking to me so this happened in 2014 the immediate recovery time was uh, probably about a couple of months, I would say, where basically I had to kind of make sure that there weren't a bunch of fake stuff going through my cards and all that type of stuff. But you won't believe this, since 2014 through 2021, I guess it was, it was the last year, every year I've had to go to my local uh, IRS office to prove that I am me. So every year they say, okay, show up. Now, now I actually know the lady because <laughs> I've seen her now for the last eight years where you have to kind of show up with all of your manual, like, you know, last three years worth of tax returns, and you have to sit down with them and then prove that you are who you say you are. And that was a direct result of the, of the identity breach incident. So some of the laggard impact of it seems to go on for years, uh, though a lot, a lot of it kind of happened in the first uh, month or two. How do we keep data safe when much of it uh, is kept by third-party vendors? So, you know, uh, it, it, that, that, that's, that's a good question. I, the way I would kind of think about it is there are bits of your information that you want to be very careful. So it's almost like a closing concentric ring where if it's like your name or uh, a base set of information you're comfortable sharing with a lot of people. By the time you get down to things like you know, names of your kids, uh, you know, maybe pictures of kids or social security number, credit card numbers, uh, you want to kind of close that sphere down to very few trusted vendors where you have a good level of comfort 
that these are folks that do take security seriously. They, because at the end of the day, you might be transacting with them, but it's your information. Like, you have to take control of what's your information. Like, if I said, you know, uh, in the physical world, uh, I'm going to come in, I'm going to take your car away, or I'm going to borrow your car, and I'm not going to return it for a while. You would take that quite seriously. Like, okay, like I don't know what does that mean. Like, you know, why are you doing that, etc. But then, you know, same individuals will go online and give up a whole bunch of information without thinking about it twice. So you do have to take control <laughs> of your information and reduce the sphere of uh, potential damage down to really trusted, trusted folks. But yeah, another thing to consider is you don't always have to give the companies and third parties real information. This is something that I think a lot of people don't realize, yeah. right? Like for your hotel, um, yes, you use you do use the right name so it matches your ID, right? But you don't actually always have to put your real address in there. And they'll ask for that as a part of your account, but you, you can lie. You can give them a different address. <laughs> and you can actually store that address so you don't forget if they ask you as like a question for yourself, maybe to verify your identity, which by the way, I don't recommend. That's called knowledge-based authentication. Don't do that. But if you need to put a lie in there, you can store it in your password manager. And um, that can keep you safe because you don't necessarily need to give everybody all the information. Think about if somebody came up to you and was like, what's your address? You'd lie, right? Or you just wouldn't give it to them. Same with many of these companies. So how useful can a VPN be? I, you know, personally, I think it's actually a great tool, right? If you think about how you access corporate security, nobody's going to let you access the corporate servers without being on a VPN encrypted tunnel. If you're at the Starbucks locally and you're on a Wi-Fi, you know, you're basically opening up, um, you know, any information in clear text over a public Wi-Fi, right? And so, uh, depending on the location, if it's a public Wi-Fi, I highly recommend having your VPN connection turned on. Even better, you know, if you've got a product like ours, it basically uh, detects that you're on a public Wi-Fi and automatically turns things on on your behalf, basically. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, and certainly outside of the U.S., it's got amazing popularity. The U.S. has sort of been the last one to adopt that for, uh, for families and, and users. So. so we've learned that bad password habits, um, because of increasing requirements of mixing complex characters, is there any going back to a more secure password model. Yeah, the most secure password model is have it generated for you by a password manager. That is the very best thing you can do to make sure your passwords are long, random, and unique for every single type of account. You trying to come up with it in your brain, I can create a set, um, a hacking uh, data set for you just based on the sports teams that you like, your parents' names, your birthday, where you live, and the types of foods you say you like to eat on social media. So you trying to come up with words to use, numbers, letters, that's going to be pretty easy for me to crack. Um, so I really do recommend that you generate your password using a password so manager. How, going on that, so how much of a target are sites like um, last pass and one password. I have I mean, a really they, good answer for this, but you can yeah, go first. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think, I think they are, they are very targeted, right? Because at the end of the day, if you have, uh, you know, it's, it's like uh, trying to rob a vault in a bank because there, like a lot of stuff is all there in one spot at one time. So if you've got a lot of users and a lot of their proprietary information is stored inside these password vaults, um, then people want to kind of get at it because in one shot you can pick up a whole lot of stuff. But that being said, we know 1Password and Jeffrey's actually an investor in 1Password as well, and they are just absolutely insane about the kind of security, how, what they store, what they don't store, because they know their, their target. So that's you know one of those companies that I would put inside my trusted sphere of influence because they understand the gravity of what can happen if, if they get breached. Absolutely, and a lot of people will ask me, Rachel, why would you want me to use a password manager? Isn't that putting all my eggs in one basket, right? And I really like that people are thinking like that because it shows that you're thinking about your threat model and how you would be hacked, what a target would go after. So I'll tell you this. Your password manager stores your passwords encrypted. We can't currently break encryption yep. computationally right now. It takes more time than we have on planet Earth, okay? so. Let's just say I can break your encryption. Let's just like live in a hypothetical world where I'm able to break encryption and the whole world is going wild, right? You still have multi-factor authentication on that account. You have a unique, long, and random master password that stores all of your passwords. And if you want to be so extra above and beyond paranoid, 
you can do what's called salting your passwords in your password manager, where you can store your passwords in your password manager, but you have this little key that only you know, maybe five characters at the end, and now even the most paranoid among us, if we could break encryption, break your MFA, and get your master password, I still don't have access to your passwords when I get in. Hari, is it possible to get rid of the scam calls that we're all getting multiple <laughs> times a day? Uh, you know, that's this, probably the most annoying thing of all. Yeah, you know, it's basically the, it, this was sort of regulated, which is really interesting, which is um, the, the government said, hey, if it's a, if it's a potential scam, uh, you need to actually inform the customer that kind of came down from the court. So uh, carriers have been kind of rolling this stuff out over the last kind of year or two, a little bit at a time. Well, they haven't uh, got I, to my phone number, I, I want to be really clear. <laughs> that's me. And, and so, <laughs> And so, the, you know, the, the, I think the filter still doesn't have enough to be able to figure out if it's really spam or not. And again, the scam callers are smart, and they'll keep kind of cycling numbers around. The easiest thing I would say to be able to get rid of it is get a virtual number, a second line, basically, right? Like a whisper line where basically when you're signing up for services, you don't actually give out your actual phone number, but a second phone number line that connects to your actual phone. And it, I think it's a sad state of play that we're sitting here saying, Hey, you know, you give out a fake ID when you set up at the at the hotel, like get a second phone line. But unfortunately, that is the state that we live in, and it is something that we have to be kind of careful and vigilant about. That that's what I do, and that's actually pretty helpful because all of my third-party services, I use a second phone number and my real phone number I keep for my friends and family. So yeah, the scam likely stuff is super obnoxious. I'm sorry, you're still getting all those calls from me, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> But yes, the telecom companies are working on it right now. They have this new uh, implementation called, I think it's Stir Shaken, um, that they're trying to roll out, and all the telecom companies have to adopt it to make it work, so it's going a little bit slow, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so we will receive scam likely and scams for a little bit longer, yep. but I will say, for this hack, I was trying to spoof a phone number to text you, and that was really hard because of this new implementation by all the telecoms. So yeah, round of applause for telecom companies because it was really obnoxious to try and text you as Anthony, but I could call you, so I still had that. Yeah, I don't think you're gonna get a round of applause <laughs> for the telecom companies. It's, it's hypo <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> Um, are there good insurance products to deal with some of these data breach issues for individuals? You know, uh, to be honest, we have not seen a cyber insurance go all the way down to uh, consumers and families. There's a lot of those available for enterprise and small businesses, uh, but being able to find a solution, uh, so I mean, like what, what we do offer at Aura is uh, a million dollars at a backstop or a couple hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of cash backstop where if you've got losses, we'll just sort of fund that back in. That's about the closest I've seen, uh, that's sort of a broad policy that's available, but Beyond that, it's been hard to find something that's very cyber-focused. Uh, yeah, the consumer stuff tends to be around crypto, right? Like kind of NFT-based insurance so that if you get SIM swapped, et cetera, et cetera. But no, I haven't seen a super consumer-facing yeah, one. Yeah, I have yeah. not seen that. Yeah. So for our last question, Rachel, um, the question is, uh, have you been hacked before? And I'm praying that the answer to that is yes, so <laughs> that you can have been uh, humbled by this, as I have been. People try. I mean, when you're in the public eye, right, you have to think about your threat model. And I speak in many places. People have seen my face, and I'm on social media. I mean, I would be a hypocrite to say that I that I don't use social media, and because of that, that probably puts me at a at a bigger risk. So people try, but they've never been successful that I know of. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, it's really hard to know if you are compromised. It's one of those things, right? Like your well, when they get your credit card, yeah, when well, you figure account, out <laughs> that you know. But your computer, when I was like listening to you in the background, it's not like that indicator light came up and was like, no. Jeffrey, you are hacked. Stop having this computer in the room with your phone calls, right? Um, so it is really hard to figure out if you are indeed hacked, which is why it's so important to be uh, proactive to avoid a lot of these things on the front end. So thank you, Evil Rachel. Thank you, You're welcome. Uh, Hari. Uh, thank you all for coming, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to hack you, I'll hack you anytime, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs>